And uh, as I go through the, uh, the talk this morning, I'm going to digress a little bit uh, and uh, talk about points that I think are particularly important for you as students uh, as you embark on a, a career of surgery uh, in general. So the first question is, what is surgery? And um, every time you ask that question, everybody resorts back to the dictionary definition of what is surgery. And the dictionary definition says surgery is derived from the words hand and work. So if you put those together uh, and you take that as the definition of surgery, then it doesn't differentiate you from anybody else in the world. We all use our hands every moment of the day. So we need to look for a different explanation of what surgery is uh, and what a surgeon is. And what a surgeon is, is an individual who deals with diseases that have, that have an anatomical basis. And the surgeon either reverses or compensates for those particular anatomical abnormalities. And anatomical abnormalities are abnormalities in shape. So the surgeon is somebody who deals with abnormalities in shape, and he, correct, he or she corrects them or reverses them. And now that's the first point in relation to surgery that uh, is very useful. So every time you open up a textbook from now on, you should say to yourself, well, what's the anatomical abnormality of shape that I need to be looking for here? And how does the surgeon correct, investigate and correct that abnormality? The next point is that uh, the, uh, everything has to be simple uh, in surgery. I firmly believe that point. Um, because if things aren't simple in surgery, then we're not going to be able to repeatedly operate on patients millions of times every year and do it with acceptable rates of complications. So if it was complex, it simply wouldn't be possible for us to repeatedly operate millions and millions of times annually uh, and uh, without uh, acceptable rates of complications. So surgery has to be simple, and as you go through your careers, try to resist the urge to complicate it. Okay, very important thing to bear in mind. This is a very good uh, quote from William Hunter, who was John Hunter's brother, and he said that anatomy is the only solid foundation of medicine. It is to the physician and surgeon what geometry is to the astronomer. I'm not sure that's absolutely correct, but it's a good uh, starting point for a lecture such as this. Now, so surgery must be simple, and the surgeon must have an accurate understanding of anatomy and shape. And it might come as a surprise to you to know that the understanding that we've had of the mesentery uh, has been both inaccurate and very, very complex. And the mesentery has always been it's a topic that we hope would never come up in exams. Pray every night that one. Just hope this topic doesn't come up tomorrow in the exam. And it never did, because by and large, the people who were teaching you actually didn't really understand it either. Okay, so you're very lucky in that regard. And what I'm going to show you now is the old model of the mesentery. This is the model that uh, is the classic model. And this is a video, uh, and as I go through this video, I want you firstly to notice this particular image. Many of you might be familiar with this image. It, it, this image, or a derivation of it, is in practically all of your textbooks today. Surgical reference, surgical reference, anatomical, radiological. And it's the starting point for the discussion on the mesentery. And as I play this on, you're going to see the mesentery, the old model that is. It's uh, the yellow structure. And as you look at it, the first thing I want you to notice is that according to the old model, there are multiple mesenteries. Okay, that's the first one. And the second point is that as you look up to the right colon and the left colon, you know according to this model, these do not have a mesentery. You can take up any textbook nowadays and they will say there is no mesentery associated with the right and the left. So I'll play this video on. It's a digital sculpture. Uh, it's all of the digital sculptures I'm going to show you this morning are we make them ourselves by uh, an astonishing medical illustrator who does these for us and he presents these in a, in a very nice uh, manner. So I'm just going to turn off turn on the lights here. Right there as well. So there you see multiple mesentries. Okay, and these are all of the images that are in all of our textbooks even today. You pick them up any one of them and you'll see it's derived from that particular uh, image. Okay, in 2012, we noticed that uh, when we're doing when we're operating in colorectal surgery, taking on a right-sided cancer or a left-sided cancer, we mobilise a mesentery associated with the right colon and with the left colon, and we noticed that this happens in everybody, 
And even if you have a congenital abnormality, you'll notice that there is a mesentery associated with the right colon and with the left colon. So we thought there's something wrong here. Our anatomic textbooks are telling us one thing, but as surgeons, we do something else. So there was a discrepancy. And we set about looking at this, so we did a study in which we confirmed that universally, there is a reason tree on the right side and there is one on the left side. Now, uh, colorectal surgeons, as I said, knew this. We knew this for the past 100 years, so there's nothing new in this. But the implications of this were not recognized, and the implications of this are very important. And one implication, for example, is that if there's a mesentery on the right and on the left, and we know it's already in the middle and in between, then it's not a huge leap of the imagination to think that this is an actual fact, one structure throughout. And if you dissect it, and if you expose it, and if you're careful with your dissection, you'll actually see that you can mobilize uh, an intact mesentery all the way from the esophagogastric junction right down to the anorectal junction. So it's one continuous structure. And the model that we now understand of the mesentery is as follows. Again, this is a somewhat stylized 3D digital sculpture. This is going to be published soon in Gray's Surgical Anatomy. And you'll see the mesentery is the structure in yellow. Uh, and as the organs disappear, you'll see that it is an enormous structure. It is substantive. You can differentiate it very easily from all of the structures around it. Uh, and you can see that there's an upper region, which is the dorsal mesogastrium, and a lower region. And then you see that these are connected uh, with a region in the middle, which is the mesenteric root region. And then you'll see that all of the vessels that supply and drain organs are embedded within the mesentery. All of these use the mesentery. So it acts like a circuit board or a motherboard, so to speak, containing all of the vessels. And then what you'll see is that all of the abdominal digestive system organs are actually positioned around the mesentery. So it's like a Christmas tree in decorations. The decorations are the organs, and the mesentery is the Christmas tree. And you'll see that the liver, the spleen, the pancreas, and all of these are actually positioned around the mesentery. So we now have a new understanding of the anatomy of the mesentery. And this is really only recent, this is since 2012. This is important because as we now understand its shape, we can systematically study it. The systematic study of anything is the science of that particular structure. And in this case, it's the science of the organ. What's the most important point here for you as students? Personally, I think the most important point is not that this is a continuous structure and a substantive one. It's that wherever there is dogma in medicine, you need to be careful. You need to be suspicious of dogma. And the dogma of the last hundred years is that this structure is made up of multiple separate entities. And we now know that that's incorrect. So wherever there is dogma in medicine, you as students need to be suspicious of it and you need to question it. That's the first point that I'd like to emphasize. Okay, these models, I hope it's, it's not too early in the morning, but these are just demonstrated. This is a cadaveric demonstration of what we're talking about. I'll just show this briefly. There's the left colon, the transverse, and there's the mesentery there. Here we have the small intestine, and there's the right colon, and there's the mesentery uh, inside there. I know it's very early in the morning, and I hope this isn't uh, too visceral for everybody. Now, the next thing I'd like to say to you as students is that uh, history is important. Everybody's going to go, oh no, please stop another lecture on history and the importance of this thing. But think about it. You are defined by your history. Who you are now is who you were yesterday, and that's defined by it. And who you're going to be tomorrow, and what you're going to do tomorrow, is determined by what you do, what you are today. And the same goes for surgery. And you can understand surgery better if you understand the history of surgery and what led to surgery up to now. And the history of surgery is really fascinating, because if you dig deep enough, you'll find that all of the answers to the questions, well, most of the answers to the questions, are actually there already. And all you have to do is go back far enough in history and you'll see it. And if you look at the history of the mesentery, it's really fascinating because the concept of multiple separate mesenteries arose with this guy, Henry Gray, no less. In 1858, he was the first man, or first person, to use mesenteries. And he created this impression, or he led to this impression, that was subsequently indoctrinated in surgery, radiology, anatomy, that there are multiple mesentries. But if you go back, you can go back to the 1700s, 1750 to German anatomists, 
you can go back to the 1600s, and you can go right back to 1552, and you can see that here, this is Eustatius, and Eustatius drew a continuous mesentery. And you can go right back to the father of anatomy, and the father of anatomy is Vesalius, shown here, and in 1543, in the book that is regarded as the foundation of anatomy, he drew a continuous mesentery. Not as elegant and nice as the Eustatius one, but nevertheless he drew it. And you can go even further back to the big gun himself, Da Vinci, and Da Vinci drew a continuous mesentery. And everybody was calling it the mesenterium. So if you go into history, you'll see that the answer was there already, and that we already knew that this was one continuous structure, and that unfortunately an error crept into the description somewhere along the line. And I'd just like to draw your attention to this comparison. This is the mesentery as we now understand it. This is the lower part of the intestinal tract, and that's the mesentery associated with it. And here's the eustatius one. And here you see the small intestinal mesentery, the right mesocolon, transverse left, going right down into the rectum. And here you'll see a similar spiral conformation in the modern interpretation of the mesentery down below. So history is important, and the answers to many of the questions that you need is actually in history. And it's just a question of you digging deep uh, to find it. And this, or the research that we conducted led to a change in Gray's anatomy. This is the change. The mesocolon extends along the entire length and is continuous with the small bone mesentery proximally and with the mesorectal distally. It might seem like a small change, but it is an extremely important change because it means that the mesentery is continuous all the way from the esophageal gastric down to the inner rectal uh, junctions. So we were delighted when that uh, change emerged. Now the next important point for you as students is to realize that uh, medicine and surgery has to be fun, okay? And this is a really important point that I'm, I'm sure my colleagues are going to say this during the day. If it's the case that this isn't fun and medicine and surgery are not fun for you as you go through, then you can't excel and you can't be really, really good at what you're doing unless you really enjoy it. So always and be really honest with yourself as you're going through your career and seek out what is fun and what you enjoy and what you enjoy doing. And the thing that we enjoy doing most in Limerick and in surgery in Limerick in Ireland is uh, asking questions. So we develop an understanding and then we ask the next question that follows on from that and then we ask the next question that follows on from that. So we kind of exist in this boundary zone where uh, you can ask questions, the next logical question, and then you have to answer that question. And that's a good practice in life. Not to just stop with your current understanding, but ask the next logical question. So the next logical question here is, well, if we have a new understanding of the mesentery, then we need to go back to its embryology, and we need to revisit the whole embryology. And how do you do that? Well, what you can do is you can go back to fetal data sets, you can reconstruct these data sets using 3D techniques, and then you can reconstruct the mesentery at different stages, and you can generate a picture of the development of the mesentery at different stages during fetal development. This is the intestine at uh, week 23. And this, what I'm going to show you now, is the mesentery at week 23 in the fetus. And this is from an Italian data set. This is the rectum, and this is the mesorectum. This is an actual reconstruction from a 23-week uh, fetus. Here's the left mesocolon. Next, you're going to see the transverse colon, and you're going to see the transverse mesocolon coming to view here. And next, you're going to see the small intestine and the small intestinal mesentery coming to view. And gradually, you're going to see this picture and this model populated by mesentery all the way up to the level of the OG junction. But what you're also going to see, and this is truly fascinating, is you're going to see that the abdominal digestive organs develop within the mesentery. And that's what you're going to see here. Here we're dividing the celiac trunk and we're going to divide the superior mesenteric artery in a cadaver. And what we're going to do though is we're going to remove the entire abdominal digestive system out of this cadaver. And you'll see that it is one structure, one unit, and all of the abdominal digestive organs are actually positioned and centered around the mesentery. This is it from the front. There's the liver. This is all the small intestine. It's all quite matted because it's a cadaver. Uh, and this is the posterior surface, and that's the posterior surface of the mesentery. So you can take out the abdominal engine, the liver is being the pancreas, the entire intestine, all of these structures, ignoring them, but just concentrating on the mesentery and lifting them out of the abdomen. Now, if you can do that, you can also transplant them. That's another uh, day's discussion. 
So for the first time in history, we're able to do something very important. We're able to define precisely what the mesentery is. And this definition is very different to the definition that you'll see online, where people talk about a double fold peritoneum, and it's a double fold peritoneum as uh, supporting the intestine. We now know that the mesentery is a collection of tissues that maintains the organs of the abdominal digestive system in position and in continuity with other systems. And we would not know that had we not said, okay, well, if this is the shape of the mesentery in the adult, then what's it like in the embryo? And if that's the shape in the embryo, then what's it like in the cadaver? So by asking the next question on a continual basis, you begin to make our advances uh, in science and surgery. Now, getting on to surgery and why this is relevant to the surgeon. Well, the mesentery is held in place. How is it held in place? There's three main mechanisms. I'll just talk about two briefly. The first is the peritoneum. And the peritoneum is like a veil. So if you took the mesentery as one structure and then you put a whole veil over it, then this veil, which is the peritoneum, and you can see in this uh, 3D reconstruction, it's the translucent layer that you see, goes all the way around the mesentery, the intestine, everywhere, up around the liver, stomach, spleen, everywhere. And it holds the mesentery and the abdominal digestive system and the mesentery in place. And it's a very important structure that we exploit surgically. So this is a robotic uh, case. We're doing a, a robotic right hemicolectomy, removing the right side of the colon in a patient who has a cancer on the uh, ascending colon. There's the liver up there. There's the uh, right side of the abdomen. The intestine and the mesentria are over here. And this is us robotically dissecting through the peritoneal reflection up around the liver. And you can divide the peritoneal reflection all the way around. And when you do that, you begin to free up all of the organs and you begin to free up the mesentery and the abdominal digestive system. And there's another important mechanism that holds everything in place, and that's a fascial layer. And this fascial layer was initially described in 1878 by a Viennese anatomist, and it's been largely forgotten about up until then. And again, it just demonstrates the importance of going back to history and looking to history and seeing uh, the different discoveries that have been made. And this is called Tolls fascia. And to demonstrate Tolls fascia, you actually have to use these 3D models. And if you conceptually remove the intestine and the mesentery away from the back wall of the abdomen, and then if you're to color the fascia green, it has that color there. You can see it, and you can see the distribution of the fascia there. And if you were to go behind this fascia, you're into the kidneys, you're into the perirenal fat, you're into the erasures, you're into the true retroperitoneum, or the true posterior abdominal wall. And this was initially described way back in 1878, and largely forgotten about until recently. And this is what it looks like intraoperatively. <coughs> Again, this is further on in the patient that I showed, or in the case I showed you, up to now. So this is the uh, right hemicolectomy, a robotic case. These are the robotic instruments that we're using. There's the fascia. You can see it's a very thin translucent layer. That's an error. We've gone through the fascia and you can see the true retroperitoneum uh, behind it. And here we're dissecting the peritoneal reflection. So and there's your appendix. The mesocolon, the right mesocolon is over here. You don't see the intestine because we largely ignore it. It's an unimportant organ as far as we're concerned. Uh, and there we are, detaching the mesentery from the fascia. And by doing that, we're able to detach the entire mesenteric system away from the retroperitoneum. And you can carry that procedure all the way up and around. So that's a robotic uh, right hand collecting. So now, if you begin to ask the next question again, does this anatomic model apply everywhere? And it does. So here you have a schematic diagram. There's the ileocecal region, mesentery fascia, peritoneum. There's the mesosigmoid, mesosigmoid peritoneum, you're looking from below up. There's the mesorectum, we're looking from above down, and the pelvis would ordinarily be down here. There's the hepatic flexure, there's the splenic flexure. And the techniques that we're talking about, or the anatomic base that we're talking about, apply throughout. And this is uh, another robotic case. Here we're doing a robotic anterior resection. We're removing the rectum for a patient with a rectal cancer. The pelvis is going to be down here. We're lifting up the mesosigmoid. There's the uh, peritoneum. There's the fascia. There's the mesosigmoid above. And you can see the robotic instruments are very, very nice at sharply cutting through and bloodlessly dissecting the anatomical planes. And if we go on, this is another example. This is quite a dramatic one. Here we see, if you just look at the pulsation up here, 
you'll see the inferior mesenteric artery is pulsating nicely in the mesosigmoid. There's the fascia, the peritoneum, and again, robotically, just dissecting through it. So the mesentery, the fascia, and the peritoneum provide us with an anatomical foundation that applies everywhere from the OG junction right down to the anorectal junction. And we would not have been aware about that had we not been aware of the continuity of the mesentery, the fact that it's one single structure everywhere from the stomach down. And this is another nice example I'll very briefly show you. Here we're looking under, we're looking from below up. This is the left musicolon, so if we went directly through that, we'd be into the spleen. If we went up here, we'd be into the pancreas. Uh, there's the mesocolon, there's the retroperitoneum down there, and we're literally dissecting down. And if you look here, you might just see something move here shortly. That's the ureter moving underneath the fascia and in the retroperitoneum. So, so again, let's ask the next question. We now know the mesentery is continuous. We know that all of the abdominal digestive system organs are centered on it. We can take it all out as one package. It's the abdominal engine. It's the engine of the abdomen. Can we apply this to treatment? Can we improve outcomes for our patients? And you can. So if you start to include the mesentery in your treatment strategies, then you need to improvements for patients overall. In the past, in Crohn's disease, we always left the mesentery. And in patients who needed an operation for Crohn's, we dissected along the interface, the intersection between the mesentery and the intestine, leaving the mesentery. But if you take away the mesentery here, these are both examples of uh, resections for Crohn's. There's the iacolic resection using the old technique, and there's the new technique taking the mesentery. Then you can reduce the uh, outcomes, or you can improve outcomes for patients. These patients in whom you remove the mesentery seem to need less reoperation, they seem to have a better quality of life, they seem to have improved clinical outcomes overall. But this is early days yet, and we need to uh, examine this more. And here's something really interesting, again asking the next question. If the mesentery is an organ, then like any other organ, if there are abnormalities in the mesentery, can they affect the rest of the body? This is not my acronym, although don't look very different here. Uh, this is a CT, reconstruction of an abdomen of a man who's a little bit uh, not unlike me. And if you reconstruct it and look in here, you'll see that what we normally refer to as visceral fat, bare belly fat, is made up primarily of mesentery. That's it there, that's another region, that's another region. That's the retroperitoneum back there. So the reason I wear a loose-fitting jacket like this is to hide my bare belly fat. Okay? And for most men, as we get older, we tend to put on our weight, not the subcutaneous region, we tend to put it on in our mesentery. Okay? Now, everybody knows that visceral adiposity is associated with increases in diabetes, insulin resistance, atherosclerosis, peripheral vascular disease, stroke, you name it, everything. So we asked the question, could we look at the volume of fat here, in the mesentery, here and here, and then could we see if that was related to atherosclerosis within coronary arteries? And what we've found recently, and others have found this subsequently, is that the more fat you have in here, in this particular region, not out here, and not there, but in here, the greater the number of vessels are, that are affected in coronary artery disease. So it looks as though the more fat, the more bare belly fat I have, the greater the number of coronary artery uh, blood vessels that are going to be affected when I have coronary artery disease, and the more severe the coronary artery disease that I'm going to suffer as a result of it. So I need to start reversing my bare belly fat in some manner. So I'm going to wrap up uh, at this point. Um, again, thank you, George, and the organizing committee for allowing me to talk this morning and explain the developments of the mesentery. Uh, I think the most important points here are not the, the points in relation to the mesentery, but in relation to the story of the mesentery and how anatomy and shape is important, how it's important for you as students to be very skeptical of dogma, and wherever there's dogma, ask questions and read, read into it, because by and large, as William Osler said, the greater the ignorance, the greater the dogma. And very importantly, don't just stop at understanding something. Try to probe into it, try to probe deeper into it by asking the next questions as you go through your surgical career. Thank you very much.